everybody. Welcome to this uh, morning session. Um, the first and second lecture will be given by uh, Katie Craig, who is uh, on the faculty assistant professor at uh, UC Santa Barbara. So Katie obtained uh, her PhD in 2014 at Radberg University with uh, Eric Carlin, my former colleague. Then uh, she held uh, an NSF postdoc position at UCLA. And uh, also she got the UC presidential postdoc fellowship before joining the faculty at uh, UC Santa Barbara. So today she will talk about uh, gradient flow in PD. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much uh, for that introduction and uh, for inviting me here to give this introductory lecture. And my goal is going to really uh, make it introductory. Um, I know there are a lot of people at this conference from a variety of backgrounds, um, optimization, sampling, as well as PDE. So I hope that there will be something in this lecture uh, for everyone. Um, so I'd like to begin this lecture on PDE with a little bit of motivation as to why you might be interested in PDEs if you're not already. For example, if you come from a background uh, where you typically deal with more spatially discrete objects. Um, so I'm going to begin by just giving you a few examples of some PDEs uh, that might be of interest to you. Uh, so throughout my talk, I'm going to be all of the PDEs that I mentioned are going to be describing the evolution of a density row. Rho is going to depend on space and time. Um, and you can think of my variable x as just a, a vector in RD. <clears throat> uh, all of the equations I describe are going to be, uh, uh, all of the equations I talk about are going to be describing the evolution of rho, thinking of rho as a type of density. For example, a density of particles at location x in time t. Um, so the most you know, fundamental um, equation that I'll, of, of all that I'll mention um, is the continuity equation. Uh, so the continuity equation is just says that the time derivative of rho plus the divergence of some given velocity field, v, v can depend on both space and time, times rho equals zero. And we typically think of this as an initial value problem. So we prescribe the, uh, the density at time zero. And then we want to see what happens over time when the density evolves according to this PDE. And you know, it's, given that I've, I've stated this at such a level of generality that you can pick whichever velocity field you like, um, solutions of this equation uh, could look uh, like lots of different things. Um, maybe the simplest example to draw would be a velocity field that's just identically equal to one for all space and time. Um, and in this case, uh, if I start off with some initial density that looks like that, over time, it's just going to uh, shift to the right. Um, so this is uh, this overly simple example is just showing that the continuity equation, you know, matches your intuition of what um, an equation like this should be doing. It's really describing how a density of particles moves over time according to this velocity. In this case, the velocity just says shift to the right. Okay, so um, something that's nice about uh, the continuity equation and uh, is that it has a, a, a useful discretization from a particle perspective. Um, in particular, you can think about a associated ordinary differential equation. Um, so I'm gonna now be thinking about um, uh, uh, the evolution of n particles. Um, and I'll think of these as particles in Euclidean space. And uh, if I evolve these particles according to this ordinary differential equation, uh, and again, I have some uh, initial conditions. Uh, then it turns out there's a close correspondence between this system of ODEs. So I have one ODE for each of my n particles and solutions of this PDE. Um, in particular, if the velocity field, the sort of fixed velocity field I have, Vx of t, is sufficiently nice, and if, for example, if it's you know, globally Lipschitz um, in space, then as long as the initial conditions for this particle system are approximating the initial conditions for the PDE, so in other words, if I take the uh, empirical measure at each of these locations, uh, 
as long as those locations you know, converge in some sense, for example, in the Wasserstein metric, as n goes to infinity to this initial data I was thinking about at the PDE level, then it turns out the evolving empirical measure where I now take these Dirac masses and I let their locations evolve according to this PDE. Converges again in some sense, for example, uh, a Wasserstein metric uh, to the continuum solution of my PDE. Okay, so um, because of this close connection um, between um, the PDE and this particle inter interpretation, um, a lot of the PDEs I mentioned today are going to have a natural discretization at the particle level, um, which will hopefully have a, 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 a better intuition for those who come from a, a discrete background. Um, two things that I uh, neglected to mention at the very beginning um, that key properties of uh, this PDE that kind of make this particle method a bit more reasonable for it is it turns out that if you start with a, if you have a solution of this PDE where the initial condition is non-negative, it will remain non-negative for all time. So I'm always going to assume that my uh, densities are non-negative. Um, and furthermore, uh, this PDE conserves mass. So whatever the integral of the initial data is, that um, integral will be preserved over time. Um, so in other words, this is constant in time over the evolution of the PDE. And so uh, for simplicity, I'm going to normalize all of my equations. So that equals one. Um, and so this is where start probability measures start to appear. Um, or in this case, I'm just writing it as a probability density. Uh, so it's not necessarily that I have anything stochastic going on at this point. It's just that it's a non-negative density that integrates to one um, is where the kind of connection to probability densities first appears. Um, because this is an introductory talk, I'm going to mostly be writing my rows as probability densities. Um, but uh, a lot of what I say um, also works for probability measures if you're happy to kind of you know, make some abuses of notation. <clears throat> okay, so this was the simplest equation um, that I wanted to mention, the kind of fundamental building block um, for a lot of the other equations I'll talk about. Um, but in general, this equation is not a Wasserstein gradient flow um, for just an arbitrary velocity field. And so now let's focus in on the specific type of continuity equation that, that uh, say it again. Yes. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, what is sort of the typical like order of convergence of this statement? Is it something like one over square root n? Um, it would depend on, okay, so it'll, it just depends a little bit on the uh, regularity of the velocity field. Um, so if your velocity field, let's say, is globally Lipschitz, um, then you could get uh, an error. It'll depend on the rate of at which, so the estimate that you can get is that you can get something like the difference between the empirical measure at time t and the exact solution of the continuity equation will be bounded according to a constant that depends on um, time. So if we're, we're talking about bounded time intervals here. Um, it depends on this uh, global Lipschitz estimate on, on the velocity field. And, and then the Wasserstein distance between the initial data. So um, it'll depend on kind of how, if, if you want to get a rate in terms of n, then you'll need to say by what method you're sampling uh, the initial data, like how is that scaling in n. <clears throat> and okay, often in practice, this is way too strong of an assumption that that's globally Lipschitz. So you can say lots of things in, in, uh, without that assumption, but this is something that you can say at a high level of generality. Okay, so, um, so now let's talk about a specific equation that is a Wasserstein gradient flow. Um, this is an equation that's uh, attracted a lot of interest over the past 20 years, and I'll call it an aggregation equation with drift. So now we're looking at the evolution of a density uh, according to two terms. One is going to be this uh, external drift potential, and another is going to be an interaction potential. Uh, and equations of this form uh, show up a lot in applications. Um, you know, the, the drift potential uh, can be a lot of different things. It's a, a fixed function at X and, 
uh, from a mathematical perspective, that one doesn't give us too much trouble. Um, what really gives us a lot of trouble is this interaction potential, especially since the interaction potentials that show up in applications um, can have singularities. Like for example, the positive or negative Newtonian potential, this shows up in models of uh, vortex motion in superconductors and biological chemotaxis. Or another example would be these types of attractive repulsive interaction potentials um, that show up in models of biological swarming. Okay, so um, this is the term that gives us trouble. <laughs> um, so what is this, what are the dynamics that this PD describes? Well, it says that my density on one hand wants to evolve. So this is again a continuity equation where the velocity is just given by the gradient of capital V. So my but you see I've moved it to the other side of the equation. So I guess the velocity is negative the gradient of capital V. So my function rho wants to evolve down the gradient in the direction of negative the gradient of capital V. And then this term. This velocity field here uh, really causes the density to interact with itself. Um, so, for example, depending on your choice of W, like this sort of repulsive attractive one, this will cause the density to repel itself at short, short length scales, but attract itself at long length scales. And that shows up in models of biological swarming. For example, if you imagine a flock of birds, the birds repel each other at short length scales. They don't want to crash into each other, but they're attracting each other at long length scales. They want to form a cohesive flock. <clears throat> Okay, so um, this uh, equation has been studied by so many authors. I will mention just uh, two papers that were fundamental to its uh, Wasserstein gradient flow structure or to bo a book. First is the book by Ambrosio, Gili, and Savare, and the second is the paper by Perio, Di Francesco, Figali, Laurent, and Slepchev. Um, so like the continuity equation um, that we were talking about just a moment ago, uh, this PDE has a corresponding particle discretization. Um, so if you come from the discrete side of things, this uh, may give you uh, better insight into what dynamics I'm talking about here. Um, so the each uh, particle evolves according to this ordinary differential equation. And here uh, you see how um, in a sense the density is interacting with itself or the, or the particles are interacting with each other um, uh, through this term. <clears throat> Uh, like I promised, this equation does have a Wasserstein gradient flow structure. It turns out to be the gradient flow of this energy. Uh, the energy has an external potential term. Uh, and what we call an interaction potential term. And especially at the particle level, you can sort of see why this is true. The particles are going in the direction of negative the gradient of the energy, so or of the of this external potential capital V. So somehow they're 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 going to where that capital V is small, and that's exactly what's going to be making this you know, energy smaller. <clears throat> okay, so why do I mention this example of a PDE? Well, uh, for a Wasserstein gradient flow, first, it's because one, um, where the, the theory is very mature at this point. Um, and second is, is because it's going to have some uh, connections with other PDEs I'll mention in a moment. Um, and I think it could be interesting to, when studying those other PDEs that you know arise in context in like machine learning or, or sampling topics close to the heart of this workshop, um, to consider what has been done in the classical theory in this case. Um, in particular, something that I really like about this equation is that while the particle dynamics do give you a lot of intuition for what's going on at the level of the PDE, by considering solutions of the PDE, you're actually considering a richer class of dynamics than is just accessible by particles. Like particles just are just telling you what happens if you evolve a, an empirical measure according to this equation, but you can actually you know, take a much wider range of initial data. Um, and something you know, that's known in the theory of this level is that the regularity of your initial data and then the, the subsequent regularity of solutions to your PDE can actually give you better convexity properties in a weak sense of the energy. And so if you wanna get good stability properties of your gradient flow, it could be worth going to the level of the PDE, considering a broader uh, types of solutions, maybe solutions in a different regularity class than just empirical measures. Um, and then, you know, Often we, we have to get back to something discrete in order to put it into a computer, but there's a whole field of numerical analysis of PDEs to help you with that. Um, so I, I guess the reason I wanted to mention this example is just to advocate that 
the, the PDE perspective really can bring more than you just see from the particle perspective. Oh, thank you. I accidentally wrote an X instead of a Y there. Yes. Yes. W, so capital W does depend on, on, the, on both variables, but not on their difference only. Can you also say something about the gradient flow? Does it look similar? Uh, I just could I I will get to an example like that okay. in just a moment. Yeah, so that is a good point that the the uh, my function w here only depends on x and y through their difference and and that makes this the theory for this um, much easier than the theory when it depends on x and y individually. Um, okay, great. So so this was the second example of a of a type of gradient flow, um, something that is maybe of interest if you're coming from um, applied mathematics. Uh, another example of a Wasserstein gradient flow that we've seen many times uh, throughout the conference already is, of course, the fokker planck equation, which describes the evolution of a density according to, we have uh, a drift term here, notice this is the same external potential is above, um, and diffusion. Uh, this has a, a corresponding particle method. In this case, because we have diffusion present, it's a stochastic particle method. Uh, Uh, and my gradient. And interestingly, um, even at the level of this, you know, stochastic particle method, you can still come back and and make uh, improve something like the same statement that I said at the beginning. If you take solutions of the stochastic particle method and consider the empirical measure, it turns out that it will converge almost surely to a solution of the PDE. Um, so this perspective even works. Um, uh, in the stochastic case. <clears throat> uh, and then again, this is uh, truly a gradient flow in the Wasserstein metric. Because this first term is the same as the first term we saw above, it shouldn't surprise you that the first term in the energy will also be the same. And then the second term uh, in the energy is just uh, the, the entropy or, or the negative entropy, depending on if you're coming from kind of a information theory or, or physics background. Okay, and so this again makes sense. This energy makes sense corresponding to the dynamics of this PDE because this says that the density should be going towards, you know, down the gradient of V. So it'll be making that smaller. And then this says that the density is spreading out. Um, so we'll be making the, the entropy smaller. <clears throat> Okay, um, and the, the Wasserstein gradient flow in the perspective of the Walker Planck equation um, has been very productive in the past few years um, because uh, it basically, uh, by understanding convexity properties of this uh, function V, tells you about convexity properties of the energy landscape here in the Wasserstein sense that's driving these dynamics. And from the convexity properties of the energy landscape, you can recover all of the beautiful properties you might want of the Fokker-Planck equation when V is strongly convex. You know, For example, contraction of solutions, exponential convergence to equilibrium, uh, log Sobolev inequalities. Uh, so um, it's sort of a, a nice unifying perspective for a lot of one, these wonderful properties of the Fokker-Planck equation. <clears throat> yes. So, if I were to write the gradient flow of this energy, I would get uh, by default something which is deterministic, and you write it as some something stochastic. So you have choices when you actually choose your particle evolution. So here, you, that's the one you picked. Is there a particular reason you want the parameters of it to be time independent? I, no, I it was arbitrary. So um so, but this is a good point. Thank you for emphasizing this. Um, there's a key difference between this this equation and this equation. Up here, the particle evolution. Here, if I look at the empirical measure according corresponding to this, it is actually a weak solution of that PDE. It is actually a Wasserstein gradient flow of this energy. Whereas if I do the particle method, if I do the empirical measure according to this, it is not actually a Wasserstein gradient flow of this energy. Um, and so you're right that here I have some choice. Um, and it, the reason why is because I could write that PDE as a continuity type equation. You know, we've um, you, you can uh, factor things. Um, so that we write it as negative grad V, um, uh, plus negative grad rho over rho. Uh, now I'm going to put all of those in the same. Uh, 
zero. Okay, so I could write it as like a continuity equation where this is my velocity field. Um, but you can see that this is a pretty weird velocity field. In particular, for general rho, this is not going to have a global, uh, be globally Lipschitz. And so because of that, the particle method is not going to be well defined. In particular, if you, if you wanted to try to find an empirical measure solution to this PDE, you start off with initial data. That's the sum of Dirac masses instantaneously in time. It's not going to be a sum of Dirac masses. And so, so the, the kind of particle perspective, which is so nice, um, in, in the case above, because of the presence of diffusion here and its smoothing effects, it breaks down. And so there, exactly, I just picked you know, a, a different particle um, interpretation of this PD. Yes? So even more uh, basic question. Yes. Um, are, the, are the rules for deriving the particle representation from the PDE, or is your goal just to invent a particle representation that has this property of convergence of the ensemble? <clears throat> Solution. I would say um, at the level of up here, yes, there are rules for deriving it, and it's and it's just the exact uh, rule that I mentioned up here. If your velocity field is sufficiently nice, you just take the ODE with the same velocity field. So it's pretty not creative rule. Um, but uh, but indeed, the problem is, is that in practice, um, we care about many equations where the velocity field doesn't satisfy a nice enough property uh, for this system of ODEs to be well posed. And so then things start to break down. Okay, so you have to exercise some creativity in, in deriving the particle. Yes, exactly. But that's good. That keeps people like me busy. So <laughs> no creativity was involved. You know, I would be very bored. Um, Okay, so um, uh, another example, um, which has you know, been uh, worked on uh, extensively by um, many people uh, affiliated with this conference, um, is in, in recent years, it was identified that uh, models of two-layer neural networks um, in the mean field scaling regime um, can be studying using the, studied using these Wasserstein gradient flow techniques. Um, unlike above, where I've been very systematically writing the PDE, the particles, and the energy, here I'm actually just going to write the energy because uh, the PDEs and the particles Get a little messy. Um, so the energy in this case, I'm just going to write one specific choice of energy. I'm going to write the one coming from the quadratic loss. That's because it has a nice parallel with the energy I spoke of earlier. <clears throat> uh, and so I have some activation function, capital phi, x of z. I have a parameter function or a parameter measure, um, uh, rho of x dx. I have a target function that I'm trying to approximate, f naught of z. Uh, and then I have a data distribution, d nu. And a lot of different activation functions are used in practice. Uh, for example, I will just mention uh, the, uh, the ReLU activation function. Uh, and a radial basis function, activation function. Okay, so um, in this case, basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to pick uh, your parameters rho so that this parameterizes your target function as accurately as possible when measured in this sense, kind of the, the quadratic loss with respect to a given data distribution. Um, and so, you know, what was identified in many works by uh, May Montanari and Wynn, Roscoe van den Einden, uh, Shiza Bach, and, and many others, is that um, the way that you evolve these parameters in practice, if you use the mean field scaling convention, is exactly to evolve rho according to the Wasserstein gradient flow of this energy. Um, so uh, the reason why I, I chose this you know, specific case for today's introductory lecture, lecture this um, uh, quadratic loss, is because in this case, you can expand the square, and it turns out to look something uh, very much like uh, what Leon was just asking about a moment ago. Um, so I'm going to expand the square, and the first term that I'm going to get, I'm going to expand the square, and I'm going to blindly apply Fubini. So I'm going to change my orders of uh, integration. So the quadratic term um, in the square, uh, I'm going to also, you know, um, introduce a new variable since I would have to, rather than writing x twice, I'm going to call the other x y. The quadratic term looks like this. The first quadratic term, I guess. Then the cross term uh, would look like this.
And then the final term I actually don't care about because this doesn't depend on my density on my on my measure row. So it's just constant in row. And so when I'm doing gradient descent in row, that constant will go away. Okay, so why did I kind of do this uh, somewhat messy looking expansion? It's just to point out that now here I have a function of x and y. And now here I have a function of x. And so suddenly, this is exactly the same type of form as the energy that I mentioned a moment ago, where the theory of Wasserstein gradient flows is very well developed, with the key distinction that Leon pointed out, that this depends on x and y separately, as opposed to their difference, um, except for maybe if you're in the uh, radial basis function case. Okay, so, um, so this has been a, an active area uh, studying properties of the, the Wasserstein gradient flow of this energy. Um, and then uh, one last example that I'd like to mention um, that could be uh, uh, close to the interests of people here um, is uh, looking at a Wasserstein gradient flow of the chi-squared divergence. And I first learned about this from uh, uh, Philippe in his paper um, uh, with uh, Chewy, I have all the names, Chewy, Leguc, Lu, Mao, um, Nu, and uh, Riolet. Um, and in fact, uh, I at the same time was working on something very similar um, and unfortunately was unable to prove it for the exact model I had in mind. But when I switched to Philippe's model, it was much better and then we were able to prove it. So this is a, a work in progress with Karthik, Ellen, Vas Ellen Vasuthi, um, Matt Haberland, and Olga Turanova. And so um, uh, uh, what that's kind of the first authors um, were proposing in their paper was to consider uh, the chi-squared divergence for a given uh, target, which I'll call rho bar. <laughs> and to think about what the Wasserstein gradient flow of this is. And in fact, if rho bar is identically equal to one, this is just a porous medium of patient, which on the PDE side of things is something that has been well studied. Um, but for general rho bar, it becomes kind of a spatially inhomogeneous type of porous medium equation. Um, and uh, in this paper, they propose a, a particle method for discretizing it. Um, but as we've already discussed a few times in this lecture, um, Sometimes there's a canonical particle method and sometimes there's not. And this is one of the cases where there's not. If you look at the velocity field arising from this energy, this is much more like the case of diffusion where the velocity field doesn't satisfy a global Lipschitz condition. And so there's not this like natural particle method associated with it. Um, so instead you have to get a little creative. Um, and like I already said, some methods have been proposed, um, but what we uh, do in our current work is we propose uh, a different method um, which is we, we regularize this energy. Um, this was inspired by um, some previous work I had done with Jose Antonio uh, Carrillo and Francesco Patacchini. We basically sneak in a convolution kernel with the row and then leave the rest of the chi-square divergence unchanged. Um, and what's nice about this little trick is suddenly, if you look at the velocity field, now it does satisfy a global Lipschitz bound. Of course, one that deteriorates with epsilon. But now you can do, now this does have a natural particle method. Um, and what we show is that as you remove the regularization and refine the number of particles, indeed it converges to the continuum gradient flow of the energy. Um, okay, so the reason I mentioned this example is just to show that again, the Wasserstein gradient flow perspective, um, you know, may, may be of interest to you because you one might not have guessed this method if one hadn't been thinking about it, um, thinking about what the energy looks like and thinking of it from um, the gradient flow perspective. So um, it can offer kind of a different way to look at some of these problems that sometimes can be useful. <clears throat> okay, so the moral of what uh, the motivation part of my lecture was I, I hope to convince you that this Wasserstein gradient flow perspective brings new tools that would maybe complement a, a pure PDE or particle technique. Yeah, perhaps it's outside the scope of what you're saying, but uh, what was the motivation for uh, CNN and R to study this uh, so? Well, I, I don't necessarily want to answer for you, but I, maybe I can say a short answer, then you can jump in, which is I think they were. Uh, they wanted to interpret the gradient flow of the chi-square divergence as a type of kernelized Stein variational gradient descent. And it's a sampling procedure. That's the same thing that you're doing when you do a GPD, except that the GPD is an interpretation of the gradient flow of the KL. It turns out we can also see it as the gradient flow of the chi-square. 
the ones you see it at the grand school of the Pittsburgh, you actually use different, different kernels with different methods. So I, I should think Robara is something you can sample. You want to sample. You want to sample from Robara from the queries to its grid log. It's even in log four. Grid log, uh, uh, grid log the oracles. Okay, all right, so now I'm coming to the end of the, the motivation, and so I'm going to talk about the plan um, for my lecture today. Um, so my plan is to begin um, by just doing a warm up talking about gradient flow and Euclidean space um, in order to motivate the type of conditions um, that we need on our energies in order for gradient flow in metric spaces or in Wasserstein metric space to make sense. Um, second, I'm going to say just a few words about um, the kind of historical connection between gradient flow and PDE, though a lot has already been said in the previous lectures. Um, but, you know, why PDE or why gradient flow techniques are useful and, and kind of have historically been useful in PDE. Um, then I'm going to go and start talking about gradient flow on metric spaces. And the reason why I, I wanted to go this perspective is I know a lot of the people here are, come from a background in um, like uh, geometric optimization. And I think uh, you'll see many strong connections between the metric space picture and, and the, the geometric optimization lectures we heard earlier this week. And then lastly, I'll talk about what happens in a particular case where your metric is the Wasserstein metric. Okay, so let us uh, uh, jump into the first topic, um, which is uh, gradient flow on Euclidean space. Okay, so gradient flow in Euclidean space, you know, this is something that you may have seen as in an undergraduate ordinary differential equations class. We have uh, an energy E defined on RD taking on uh, real numbers. We have some initial condition, that's a real number. Um, and in this case, a gradient flow of the energy with initial conditions X naught is just a solution of this ordinary differential equation. So X of T, its time derivative evolves in the direction of negative the gradient of the energy. And at time zero, it starts off these initial conditions. Okay, so, um, you know, as a, a cartoon of what's going on here, I mean, though I think this is uh, something uh, people here are very familiar with, um, is we have some energy here. So we'll think of this as an energy defined on R2. So the gradient flow is happening down here in the plane. And basically, in order to move in the direction of negative the gradient, what does that mean? That just means that you're moving perpendicular to the level sets down the level sets of the energy. So if I have drawn the level sets down there in the plane and I pick some initial condition right here, X naught, then the gradient flow is just kind of going kind of down the level sets. And similarly, if I pick some initial condition there, Y naught, it's just gonna go kind of down the level sets in that direction. Okay, so um, the reason that I drew this kind of uh, overly simplistic picture is I just wanna emphasize uh, the role of the metric, the role of the underlying geometry. I think in gradient flow type things, we often focus a lot on the energy. Um, and especially when you're in Euclidean space, it's easy to disregard uh, the underlying metric. Um, but you see the role of the metric right here because gradient flow, it, it rolls, goes perpendicular to the level sets. And it's the metric that's telling you what does perpendicular mean. And so when you that that's you know what happens when you when you do gradient flows of, of the same energy with respect to different metrics. The energy could always be the same. Its level sets are the same. Those are intrinsic to the energy. But what the different metrics are telling you is they're telling you what does perpendicular mean in that metric. What does it mean to go down in the steepest descent with respect to a given metric? Okay, so. Um, uh, the first thing that, as a mathematician, we would ask is when do solutions of this ordinary differential equation exist? When does this even make sense as a mathematical model? An easy, sufficient condition is just if the energy is continuously differentiable. Okay, you know, super, we, we would probably hope it's continuously differentiable if we're taking its gradient. Um, uh, and so, you know, the, at least from there, maybe existence is not um, too bad. Um, but what happens when we start wanting to think about things like um, uniqueness? Uh, and so here, I would like to add actually one extra criteria to the gradient flow that I'm going to be studying, which is that the gradient flow is just going to be for non-negative times. So all that I care about is my initial condition and going forward in time. I'm not going to be wanting to go backward in time. This may not surprise you, considering that one of the gradient flows I'm working up to is the heat equation, which is an awesome equation forward in time and not as great backward in time. 
Okay, so if we're trying to just, now we want to get uniqueness of solutions of this ordinary differential equation forward in time. Um, so what are some uh, good conditions that our energy can satisfy that would guarantee uniqueness? Uh, well, again, probably in your undergraduate ordinary differential equation class, you maybe would have learned that one of the key assumptions for uniqueness is that this right-hand side needs to satisfy some kind of Lipschitz condition. Um, and so uh, we want to put a Lipschitz condition on the right-hand side, on the gradient of E. But because we only care about solutions forward in time, we can actually get away with a one-sided Lipschitz condition, uh, and which is the following. Uh, so we're going to require uh, there to exist a number lambda so that if I take the inner product of x minus y with grad of ex minus grad of ey, that's going to be greater than or equal to lambda times x minus y squared. This has to hold for all x and y. OK, so uh, you can see that if the gradient of your energy satisfied like a full Lipschitz condition, that would imply this, where lambda was negative of the Lipschitz constant, just by using the Cauchy-Schwarz uh, inequality. OK, but this is something a little bit weaker than a, a full Lipschitz condition. And we really need this weakness. Um, you know, Like I said, when we go forward and start talking about things like the heat equation, um, the heat equation, when you think of the analog of this in the Wasserstein space, you're only going to be able to get a one-sided Lipschitz estimate, not a two-sided one. Um, and you know, this relates to the fact that you know, heat equation is fine forward in time and you run into problems backward in time. Okay, so, um, so this is uh, a, a natural condition from the perspective of you know, classical ordinary differential equations, but it turns out that this condition we've actually seen so many times um, in the conference already. This turns out to be equivalent as long as, as the energy is continuously differentiable to uh, what I would call an above the tangent line inequality. So that there exists lambda so that uh, e of y minus e of x minus gradient of e of x times y minus x. Um, so if I just had greater than or equal to zero there, that would truly be saying that the function e of y lied above the tangent line. But I'm not going to put zero there. Instead, I'm going to put um, kind of, it can do, it satisfies this up to uh, this error, depending on lambda. <clears throat> okay, so, you know, clearly when with lambda is a negative number, this is a weaker hypothesis. If it's a positive number, it's a stronger hypothesis. It's an x minus y. Thank you. So can I ask you a terminology clarification? Yes. So, so if you have, when you're going to refer to Lipschitz functions, you actually want them to be, by default, you want two-sided. So like zero is like a constant function. It's not a Lipschitz function in your, in your. No, it's, uh, that's Lipschitz. Um, so, I mean, this one is telling me that f of x minus f of y is lower bounded by x minus y, right? Yes, sorry, lambda can be negative. Right. Yes, yes. Um, okay. Uh, and then, um, uh, and then finally, this is equivalent to, again, a condition that we've seen um, uh, many times uh, in this workshop, which is just that the energy be lambda convex. So that there exists some parameter lambda so that when I evaluate my energy along the line connecting a point X to the point Y, I can bound that above by one minus alpha times E of X plus alpha E of Y. If I stopped here, it would just be the usual convexity assumption. But now I'm going to add this kind of up to an error depending on lambda. Yeah, this has to not only hold um, for all x uh, and y and rd, but um, for all alpha between 0 and 1. Okay, so um, 
why do these kind of criteria, which, you know, depending on what your background is, you may prefer one to the other. Why do these uh, imply uniqueness at the in just even in Euclidean space? Um, so suppose that we have two gradient flows, X of T and Y of T. Um, we can just do a simple computation. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to prove something stronger than uniqueness. I'm going to prove a contraction inequality, you know, like we already heard about a lot on the sampling day. So if I want to prove a contraction inequality, I want to say, um, I, I want to estimate if I have one gradient uh, solution of my gradient flow at time t and another solution of my gradient flow at time t, I want to estimate how these solutions are either kind of coming together or spreading apart, depending on the distance between their initial data. Um, and so, okay, maybe first you might think about just looking at the time derivative of their distance, seeing if they're coming together or going apart, but nobody likes to differentiate the absolute value, so I'm going to put a square there. Um, so now if I differentiate this, I just first apply the chain rule to x of t minus y of t. Um, and here I could put the time derivative of x minus the time derivative of y. And I'm going to skip a step and use the fact that I know what the time derivatives are. They're solutions of the gradient flow. So the time derivative of x is just going to be negative grad e of x. And the time derivative of y would just be negative grad e of y. Switch minus signs. All right, so if I have this uh, one-sided Lipschitz condition up here, so this isn't exactly what I have here. The signs here are wrong, uh, but that's fine. I'll just multiply both sides by negative one and flip the inequality, and then I can apply it exactly down here. So I can say that this is bounded above by negative two times lambda uh, x of t minus y of t. Weird. Okay, and if you are the kind of person who does these estimates all the time, now you know you're in good shape because the time you bound you bounded the time derivative of this quantity by a constant times the quantity itself. Why is this exactly what you want? Well, you can again just think back um, to maybe an undergraduate class you took in ordinary differential equations. So think what would happen if we actually had equality there. If you were looking at this ordinary differential equation where some quantity a of t can evolve, it can evolve, it evolves with uh, equal sign according to negative two a of t. This is a maybe one of the first ordinary differential equations you would encounter and it has this nice explicit solution um, in terms of the uh, exponential. <clears throat> so, on the other hand, we have an inequality here saying that it, the rate at which this uh, grows is bounded above by that. But that's fine. What we're going to say is worst case scenario, equality holds there. So we know that the rate at which this grows always has to be smaller than the rate at which that is growing. Um, and so for that reason, we know that we have that x of t minus y of t always has to be uh, bounded above by the rate at which this um, other ODE was growing. And then I can cancel out my squares. Okay, so this gives me a contraction inequality. For example, if lambda is positive, I know that as time goes on, that's going to go to zero. And so I, I, whatever my initial conditions are, as time goes on, my solutions are going to approach each other. On the other hand, if lambda is negative, um, this is at least giving me a stability estimate. It's telling me that if my initial conditions are so far apart, the resulting solutions of my gradient flow can be at most this times this apart. <clears throat> Another thing that you, so a consequence of that is that it gives us uniqueness. If the initial conditions are the same, then X of T has to equal Y of T for all T greater than or equal to zero. So that's why this um, one-sided Lipschitz condition is exactly what we need to get uniqueness. One last thing to point out is that let's assume that we have a, a, a strictly convex energy. So it's lambda convex for lambda positive with a unique, so to have a unique global minimizer. Then you know that if you initialize your gradient flow at the unique global minimizer, it will just stay there for all time. And so that y of t would just always equal the global minimizer. And in that case, this gives us an estimate on the rate of convergence to the global minimizer at an exponential rate of convergence. Okay. So, um, okay, so a few uh, quick remarks. Um, 
if I think I will just make a very uh, small comment that while uh, Let's see. So yeah, first let me talk, let's talk about what a, a little bit more intuition behind this one-sided Lipschitz condition. Uh, first, if my energy is actually conti twice continuously differentiable, these conditions are equivalent to the Hesh having a lower bound on the Hessian. Um, I really like thinking about it this way. And even if your energy is not twice continuously differentiable, you can look at generalized notions of Hessian. And this perspective kind of really makes sense with my brain. Somehow lambda convexity is giving you um, a lower bound on the Hessian. It's a negative lower bound if lambda is negative, and it's you know, a strictly positive lower bound if lambda is positive. Um, something that you can see sort of immediately when you think about things from this perspective is that if you have an energy that's lambda not convex and another energy, ooh, that should be E sub one, uh, that's lambda one convex, then their sum is gonna be lambda not plus lambda one convex. Okay, so this convexity property behaves nice when you take sums. Um, of course, as I already said, when lambda is strictly positive, this is um, what is often known as being strongly convex. Um, and then the last comment I want to make is that uh, the third, uh, third characterization of this, the lambda convexity characterization, we evaluated the energy on a line connecting x to y um, along this line. And I just want to point out that that line right there is the geodesic from x to y in, in Euclidean space. Um, when you're working in different metrics, you will use the geodesic in that metric. Um, so that's probably something that seems familiar for those coming uh, from the uh, geometric optimization side. <clears throat> um, OK, so uh, one last convexity comment. Sometimes. So what's nice about these uniqueness assumptions is you get to pick the lambda. In particular, if you can do it for a lambda negative, that's great. It's, it's, you can still get a lot of information. You aren't gonna get you know, exponential conversions to equilibrium, but you're still gonna get great stability estimates. Um, but sometimes you can't even prove something like this for any lambda. Uh, and you know, this happens a lot when you're looking at a borderline case on the, the PDE side. Um, and so I just want to make a remark that there's another notion of convexity here. You can think about a different modulus of convexity. So instead of this x minus y here, I'm going to replace that with a function omega of x minus y. And the point here is you get to choose the lambda and you get to choose the omega. Though, of course, there are some constraints on what you can choose for omega. Um, omega x uh, has to be a, some continuous um, increasing function and uh, equals zero at zero. So popular choices of uh, omega x in practice, uh, and actually, in fact, we need a few more assumptions, which I'll say in a second, but some popular choices are, okay, of course, if I just take omega x equals x, this reduces to that. Um, but I could also choose omega of x uh, is x log x. And in this case, if lambda is negative, this is a strictly weaker hypothesis than semi-convexity. So you can have an energy that fails semi-convexity but could still satisfy this. Um, or you could also do a polynomial modulus of convexity for some p greater than one. <clears throat> and I wrote it here because it's maybe cleanest, but there are exact analogs of this on that characterization and in that characterization. <clears throat> um, so what does this mean when we come down to this uh, contraction inequality that we proved? Well, if we take this log Lipschitz modulus of convexity, it turns out to give us a double exponential rate. So the right-hand side, or maybe I'll, becomes uh, x naught minus x naught minus y naught to the power two lambda t. So if lambda is positive, this is a really fast rate of conversions to equilibrium. But of course, you know, most of the time you prove this because lambda is negative and you're trying to get something weaker than semi-convexity. Um, on the other hand, if you take a poly polynomial modulus of continuity, uh, then the right-hand side looks a bit complicated, but it basically gives you a polynomial estimate on convergence to equilibrium. And so I mentioned this because of course, we all wish we can get exponential convergence to equilibrium, but sometimes you can't. And sometimes you know you have examples that prove that that's impossible. But maybe you could still hope for a polynomial convergence to equilibrium or 
in that case, you might consider trying to prove a convexity inequality with this polynomial modulus of continuity. Or similarly, on the other side, maybe you know there's no hope of you know, exponential or even polynomial convergence to equilibrium. You know you have a non-convex energy landscape, but you would just kill for a stability estimate. Um, maybe there's no hope of a, of a stability estimate along these lines, but maybe there's a hope of a stability estimate along these lines for a negative lambda, value of lambda. <clears throat> Why, why did you call this W exponential? Uh, because it's, it's oh, I, forgot, I think, good question. I dropped the E. Thank you. Thank you. I typo, important typo. Yes. So it's this to the power E to the two lambda T. Okay. So, all right. So gradient flow in Euclidean space, this is something that uh, a lot of us um, have a lot of experience with, but how does this nice gradient flow theory on Euclidean space have any hope of extending to a general metric space? Um, so I wanna talk about two other um, attributes of gradient flow on Euclidean space that will help us generalize to a metric space. Um, and the first is called the energy dissipation equality. And this is kind of a fancy, overly fancy name, probably in the Euclidean case. Um, it's just pointing out that being a solution of my, yes, Question. Does semi convexity plus C1 implies existence? Of the. Uh, yes. In, uh, in fact, um, uh, just C1 implies global existence. But C1, well, but C1 could go at infinity, right? Because you could take E of X minus. You're right. Y. Sorry. It, I, and I, I guess I haven't. I've been neglecting any sorts of um, concerns at infinity. Yes, uh, exactly. See, for example, if you have some sort of quadratic growth, any type of coercivity at infinity or lower bound. Yes, yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, so, um, okay, so here's our gradient flow. Uh, so what is this saying? This is saying that uh, X of T, it, the time derivative of X points in the direction of negative the gradient of the energy. So in other words, this vector and this vector, they have the same magnitude, but they point in different directions. So we can write that as they have the same magnitude. Um, and then we can write the fact that they point in different directions actually kind of, you can sneak that into the chain rule. So we know that this always would equal, you know, again, sufficient regularity on E, the gradient of E taking the inner product with X of T. And the gradient of E, when you take the inner product with X of T, by Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, that's always going to be greater than or equal to, uh, negative the product of their magnitudes. And equality will only hold if they point in opposite directions. Okay, so this ensures that they're pointing in opposite directions and this ensures that they have, uh, that they have the same length so that these two requirements are equivalent to that one. <clears throat> and then uh, lastly, we can use this fact that if you take the, the product of two real numbers, A and B, this is always going to be greater than or equal to negative A squared over two minus B squared over two with equality only if uh, A equals B. <clears throat> and so because of that, these two equalities here are actually equivalent. So A equals minus B. Thank you. Uh, are actually equivalent to requiring that this be less than or equal to negative one half gradient of this minus negative one half x dot of t. Because the other inequality always holds, and the only way for this to hold is if actually um, this equals the opposite of that. Okay, so, um, 
So why did I go through this? Uh, it turns out that while the left-hand side here is something that it's really using gradients, you know, gradients make sense in Euclidean space, they make sense on a Ramanian manifold, but we don't generally have a notion of gradient in arbitrary metric space. The quantities here are all going to be things that we can make sense of in an arbitrary metric space. Can I ask a question about that question? Yes. Are there sort of like examples where like uh, on, on metric spaces where there's like PD holds in a non-trivial way, but that metric space doesn't admit like a Riemannian structure, at least morally? Um, so do there exist? So yeah, we can talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but I think you're, I'll define a notion of curve of maximal slope on a metric space. And I think your question is, do there exist curves of maximal slope on metric spaces, um, which lack Ramanian structures? Is that your question? Uh, yeah, I guess like, um, you know, the main example I have in mind is like Wasserstein and gradient flows for this, but um, of course Wasserstein space, at least like formally does have a Riemannian structure. So I was just wondering like, what, what actual like, generality do you get from this setup? You can define a curve of maximal slope on an arbitrary complete metric space. But, and and uh, do they always like, exist? Uh, uh, yes, you, I mean, you, I, there, I, I guess I'm, it's gonna be hard for me to come up with an explicit example on the spot, but yes, we could think of a metric space where a curve of maximal slope exists, um, is unique, and that that metric space does not have a Ramanian structure. But um, on the flip side, you still, it, I think your intuition is right in the sense that I'm going to spend a lot of time today talking about curves of maximal slope on metric spaces, which are super, but you don't always have a very nice characterization of them. Like what's so great about the Wasserstein gradient flows is that you have these multiple equivalent characterization of the same things. And that gives you so many tools to attack them. For a curve on a general metric space, I'll define what it means to be a curve of maximal slope. Great, you'll know this inequality holds, but unless you have a lot of the same ingredients as in the Wasserstein case, and I'll talk about what ingredients those are, you're not gonna have a nice differential equation characterization of that gradient flow. Maybe just a comment. I don't know if I understood it. Uh, so uh, you, you were also asking, does there exist sometimes some, something where it has a decent uh, uh, gradient flow structure, but the, uh, some of the remaining aspect of it doesn't really work? And uh, let's say mean curvature flow is an example of that. So if you look at uh, sets and your energy is the parameter, right? And then your metric is uh, the L2 norm of the velocity integrated along the parameter, right? then uh, this has a formal gradient flow structure, yet the geometry on the space of curves, right? And this was proved by Munker and Nikori in 2005, it generates. So namely the distance between any two curves is zero, right? They are curved, they are paths of arbitrarily small length. Yet the L2 gradient flow structure is still useful in some ways. Let's see. Okay, so I think um, because we're coming to the end of this first um, part, I'm going to leave this time discretization to the next part. So um, when we come back after the break, I'll say a little bit about time discretization for gradient flows in Euclidean space, and then we will jump into the metric space concept context. Thank you. All right, thank you. We have time for one one question. Any more questions?